Well, good morning, St. Luke's. Good morning. I love that you say good morning back. Um, my name is Danielle Timonio Hansen. I'm an Episcopal priest and a professor over at Candler School of Theology at Emory. And I teach students about chaplaincy and pastoral care. So some of you who come to the service may also know me because I'm often in the balcony with my um, children. They're nine, five, and a newly minted two-year-old, and they really like to um, draw and eat goldfish up there and watch all of you all worshiping and participating as they're evil. And they also have a real love of the candles, so you might see them in the candle area. So I'm also, um, I'm often in the balcony as a mother as well as um, a priest. And I'm married to my husband, Eric, who is a math teacher. And we all joined the St. Luke's family about a year ago when we moved here. And we've really enjoyed getting to know you. Today, though, I'm here as your preacher. And I'm excited to talk a little bit about this story. Today we meet Jesus at the seaside, which is a little ironic because he isn't talking about the sea. This story has nothing to do with fish or dolphins. This is a story very much about the land. You heard it um, read to you just now. A sower throws a bunch of seed. Some of it lands on rocky soil, some of it gets eaten by some birds, there are thorns, there are all sorts of dangers from this soil in the land, and then some of it has the good fortune to land on good soil, fertile soil, and it sprouts and grows. This is not a moment where Jesus is performing a miracle for this crowd at the sea either. Jesus isn't making the seed grow in the thorny soil. He's not creating things in places where they don't belong, which between you and me, I think was a bit of a bummer for the crowd because I think they would have liked to see that and I would have loved to hear about it. But of course, by this point in Jesus's life, the people in this crowd kind of know what they're signing on for by showing up to hear Jesus talk. This isn't chapter one of Matthew. This is chapter the middle of the Gospel of Matthew. The crowd understands by now that Jesus is something of a fiery figure. He's a little controversial. He didn't shy away from arguing with, with the Pharisees. We heard that about a chapter earlier. And now in the background, they're plotting against him. He also recently made it clear that he's not afraid of disowning his family if they don't follow him. And soon, about a chapter from now in the same gospel, he will no longer be welcome in his hometown. So in some ways, it seems like Jesus has actually toned it back a little today. This is a nice sweet story about plants. How much sweeter can you get than plants? <laughs> Jesus also makes it easy for us in this story. He gives us an interpretation. It's all laid out in the second paragraph of the gospel reading for today for you. It's pretty straightforward. It ought to make my job pretty easy. And yet, I think Jesus isn't telling us something. And what he's not saying is as important as what he is saying. See, Jesus tells us that there's good soil and there's bad soil, and he makes it pretty clear that either he or God is the sower and we're the seed. But why is there bad soil? Soil. Like, seriously, why is there bad soil at all? If the God of our faith is supposed to be a good God, then why throw some of us onto rocks 
or thorns. The soil isn't magically going to change, which means that the seed, as Jesus tells us, will be destroyed. And that seems like a pretty lousy destiny for some unfortunate souls. And it's all entirely outside of their control because they didn't point to where they wanted to go. They just got thrown there. What did they do to deserve that? Moreover, if the sower knows that some of this soil is barren or inhospitable, why throw seed there? I mean, it's just, it's wasteful, don't you think? I would think the sower would have been much better off exercising a little restraint, only throwing that precious seed in the places where it had a chance to thrive. But perhaps even more importantly, who are these people who get to fall on the good soil? Jesus seems pretty clear that the Pharisees aren't included, made that clear a chapter or two ago, hence the plotting against him. They're not on great terms. So maybe this crowd of people who gathers at the seashore are the target audience. They seem pretty loyal, except that much later, around chapter 27 of Matthew's Gospel, Matthew tells us that they fall away when things get rough around the time of the crucifixion. So maybe it's the disciples who fit the bill. They've been with Jesus from the start. They're his most loyal followers. But you all know they have their moments of weakness too, times when they really profoundly don't get it. And they seem pretty woefully ignorant of what Jesus is really up to. After all, it's not a stranger who betrays Jesus in the end. It's Judas, one of his closest followers. So proximity, it would seem, is no guarantee that your roots will receive hearty spiritual nourishment. So if these people aren't examples of the seeds that are falling on good soil, then who's left? Who are these golden children who are receiving the fruitful end of Jesus' bargain? These monocots and dicots that are sprouting up and reaching towards the sun. And let me tell you, the monocots and dicots came from ninth grade biology, and I'm so glad I remembered that this morning. <laughs> so, I mean, it just, it doesn't seem like there's anyone left. Isn't that just so awkward? Okay, so to summarize where we are at the moment, number one, the sower doesn't seem to know where to sow. Number two, (laughs) the soil is too variable. And number three, every seed seems like a dud. So in short, this is all not as straightforward as it seemed at first glance. So, What do we do with all of that? When I've read this story in the past, I've thought about these seeds being single people, each one of us being a seed. We individually get thrown by God to a destiny, and presumably, because each of us is here in church, we can take a deep breath and believe that, yes, We are the ones who have been thrust into the good soil. Thank goodness for that. But as I pondered the text for this week, I realized that this might be a really oversimplified and self-satisfying approach. First of all, how am I supposed to be so sure that I landed in good soil? What makes me better than someone else? If I'm honest, you know, just between you and me here, I've got some imperfections. I'm no better than the disciples in the crowd. And even if I didn't have concrete data to back that up, 
It's always seemed strange to me that God would favor some people more than others. If, as the Genesis writer writes all the way back in chapter 1 of Genesis, chapter 1, verse 28, all the way back at the beginning, if we're all made in the image of God, then aren't we all worthy of dignity and love? So this morning, I'm wondering about this idea. What if our soil is kind of smushed together? Some rocky, some barren, some over-harvested, some rich and fertile, and we exist in all of it. But we couldn't really do that as one seed, which makes me wonder if the seeds aren't really representing individuals so much as us as a human family, as a community. The seeds aren't so much single souls as humanity on the whole. We're all thrown here and there together. We're all exposed to some toxic sludge. And we're all exposed to some hardy stuff too. And we get to experience that and make a choice. If we read the gospel this way, as a story of us as a community, instead of a story of us as individuals, then I think it's also possibly to see God a little bit differently in this story too. No longer is God just this thoughtless sower, kind of throwing seed haphazardly into places where it doesn't belong, and destining it to an irretrievable dud of a future. Now God is throwing expansively and abundantly and giving us a chance to struggle as well as a chance to grow. Hmm. This is also a God who starts with the promise that each of us is an equal and none of us is born or destined to be better than anyone else. Instead, we are each of us, beloved. And because of that, we deserve a chance to emerge from the soil tall and strong, reaching toward the sun that was made by God, who created and continues to love each and every one of us. Amen. Amen.